In most sci-fi stories, the speed of light is treated like a futuristic cosmic highway, our ticket to zipping between stars and galaxies. Characters like The Flash even break that limit, using super speed to travel through time. But is any of this actually possible? Could we ever reach or even surpass the speed of light? As exciting as it sounds, this remains one of the greatest challenges in science, one that might lie far beyond even our most advanced future technologies. Actually, this question was explained many years ago by someone you've probably heard of, Albert Einstein. The guy is known for a lot, but his theories of relativity are what really put him on the map. The first one, special relativity, is where he started flipping the old-school view of the universe on its head. It gave scientists a whole new way to think about how things move through space and time and led to important revelations about the relationship between energy and also our key to answering the question. One of the two core postulates of Einstein's special theory of relativity is that light always travels at the same speed in a vacuum, which is 299,792,458 meters per second, regardless of the observer's motion. This was a big shift from earlier beliefs. Before the 1600s, people thought light moved instantaneously. But wait, if the speed of light is finite, what happens to light emitted from a moving rocket? Shouldn't it travel faster than light itself? Einstein wrestled with this paradox and came to a crazy conclusion. The motion of an object must somehow make time slow down. Time was no longer constant. At first, this idea can be difficult to grasp, but Einstein said, don't worry, buddy. It can be understood quite easily using a simple device called a photon clock. A photon clock consists of two mirrors facing each other, with a photon bouncing back and forth between them. Each time the photon hits the bottom mirror, we can think of it as a tick of the clock. Now, imagine this clock is inside that moving spaceship, and we observe it from outside the ship. From our point of view, the photon isn't just bouncing straight up and down anymore, it's following a diagonal path because the ship is moving. This means the photon has to travel a longer distance between each tick. But here is the key point. The speed of light is always the same in all reference frames. Since the photon is covering more distance at the same speed, it must take more time between ticks. In other words, we observe the photon clock ticking more slowly. Time appears to pass more slowly for the moving clock. This is time dilation. Many experiments have carefully tested Einstein's predictions. Physicists Joseph Haffel and Richard E. Keating, for example, flew synchronized, ultra-precise cesium atomic clocks on commercial airliners around the world. After the flights, the moving clocks showed different times compared to one another and to a reference clock that had stayed in the lab. Time had passed more slowly for the clocks in motion, just as Einstein predicted. The same principle applies to people, too. If you are moving, the faster you go, the slower you will age compared to someone standing still. A neat trick to stay young, I must say. Yeah, that's cool and all, but how does time dilation explain why we can't reach the speed of light? Don't worry, I'm just about to get to that part. But first, please hit that subscribe button. It would mean a lot and really help motivate us. Thanks. And now back to the topic. The amount of time dilation can be calculated using the Pythagorean theorem, along with the formula velocity times time equals distance. By assuming the speed of light is constant, it's possible to derive the Lorentz transformation and understand the phenomenon. Let's imagine a really advanced spacecraft capable of accelerating at 1,000 kilometers per second every second, and you're observing it from a stationary point. At first, nothing seems out of the ordinary. Every second, you see the spacecraft getting 1,000 kilometers per second faster. But after a while, you start noticing something strange happening. It's important to understand that if you were the one moving faster and faster, you wouldn't feel any of these effects. Time would feel normal to you, and your length would remain unchanged. However, someone observing you from a stationary point, such as a celestial station platform, would be able to detect the differences using the Lorentz factor. For everyday objects moving at everyday speeds, the Lorentz factor is almost one, meaning relativistic effects are negligible. 
These effects only become significant as speeds approach the speed of light. For example, at 87% the speed of light, time dilation becomes noticeable. Dilated time is twice the proper time. This means that, if you're watching a spaceship move at that speed, while two seconds pass on the ship's clock, you would see only one second pass on your own. For our example, you will now see that it takes two seconds for the ship to gain another 1,000 kilometers per hour. In other words, you see its acceleration effectively halving. At 99.9% .9 the speed of light, the effect is far more dramatic. Time slows down by a factor of 22. So, you'd have to wait 22 seconds just to see the ship gain another 1,000 kilometers per hour. And at 99.99%, that factor jumps to about 70. Do you see what's happening here? Because of time dilation, everything begins to slow down. The closer you get to the speed of light, the more time stretches. From an outside observer's point of view, it would take you billions of years, and eventually an eternity, to actually reach the speed of light. At that point, everything appears frozen. Photons, which normally transfer energy and force between atoms, are now traveling such long distances that it takes them an incredibly long time to do so. The process slows down so much that motion nearly comes to a standstill, not because you've stopped, but because time itself has. And that, my friend, is why nothing can travel faster than light, at or near, light speed. Now wait a second, what if I increase my fuel output? Suppose I increase it proportionally, for example, at 87% the speed of light, what if I double the fuel output and double the force to get twice the acceleration? Then, even after accounting for time dilation, from the outside, it should still look like the acceleration stays the same, right? Well, yeah, let's do that. Let's keep adjusting for time dilation and keep increasing the force. But hold on, that means the faster the spacecraft goes, the more fuel it needs to burn just to maintain the same observed acceleration. To keep the acceleration constant from the outside perspective, the fuel output would have to increase continuously, and that quickly becomes a problem. You will soon need an infinite amount of fuel to keep up. In short, to reach the speed of light with a finite amount of fuel, you need infinite time. But if you want to reach the speed of light in a finite time, you need infinite fuel and thrust. Wow, that's just scratching the surface when it comes to the speed of light. I haven't even gotten into some other issues, like how you're supposed to stop once you reach that speed. In the vacuum of space, there's no air resistance to slow you down, and just like accelerating to light speed requires infinite energy, so does braking. Slamming into anything at that velocity? Yeah, not exactly a survivable scenario. Besides, the speed of light really isn't that fast, at least not when you zoom out to the scale of the universe. Sure, it's incredibly quick within our solar system. Light travels nearly 6 trillion miles, or about 10 trillion kilometers, in a single year. This distance is known as a light year, and it's a key way astronomers measure the vastness of space. To put things in perspective, light from the moon takes just about one second to reach us, which means it's one light second away. Sunlight takes around eight minutes, but the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri, is much farther. Its light takes roughly 4.3 years to reach Earth, meaning it is 4.3 light years away. Now, zoom out even more. Our Milky Way galaxy spans at least 100,000 light years across. We're located about 26,000 light years from its center. And that's just our galaxy, one among at least 100 billion in the observable universe. Some of the photons from the outer edges of the Milky Way have been traveling toward us for a third of human history. The scale increases further. Our galaxy belongs to a collection called the Local Group, a cluster of at least 55 galaxies spread across about 10 million light years. This group includes nearby neighbors like the Andromeda and Triangulum galaxies. If you travel out about 55 million light years from Earth, you reach the Virgo Cluster, which contains around 1,300 galaxies of all kinds. And beyond that lie even larger and more distant galaxy groups, numbering in the countless millions. When we reach the largest cosmic structures, we're talking about superclusters and massive walls of galaxy clusters. One example is Laniakea, the enormous supercluster that we are part of. It spans about 500 million light years across. There are many others like it, forming a vast and intricate structure known as the cosmic web. So, 
How big is the universe? The observable part is estimated to be at least 93 billion light years in diameter. However, this might only be a fraction of the whole. If the theory of cosmic inflation is correct, and much evidence suggests it is, then the universe could be far larger than we can observe. In fact, it might be infinite. And on top of that, we know the universe isn't just expanding, it's expanding faster and faster over time. One last thing is that, even though physics says as we can't reach the speed of light, NASA is researching ways to get close. One method involves electromagnetic fields. These fields, made up of electric and magnetic components, can accelerate charged particles to extremely high speeds. In space, this happens naturally. On Earth, we harness it in places like the Large Hadron Collider, where particles are accelerated to 99.9999998996% of the speed of light. These collisions help scientists study the building blocks of the universe and understand what happened just after the Big Bang. Magnetic fields are found throughout space, wrapping around planets like Earth and stretching across the solar system. These fields guide charged particles, which spiral along the invisible magnetic lines as they move through space. Sometimes magnetic fields collide and become twisted or tangled. When the stress between these tangled field lines becomes too great, they suddenly snap and reconnect in a violent process called magnetic reconnection. This rapid rearrangement generates electric fields that fling nearby charged particles outward at incredibly high speeds. Scientists believe magnetic reconnection may be one of the key processes that accelerates particles, such as those in the solar wind, to near light speeds. These energetic particles can have powerful effects near planets. On Earth, magnetic reconnection happens where the Sun's magnetic field interacts with Earth's magnetosphere. When it occurs on the side of Earth facing away from the Sun, particles are shot into the upper atmosphere, lighting up the sky with auroras. Similar processes are thought to take place at other planets, like Jupiter and Saturn, although under different magnetic conditions. To study this phenomenon, NASA launched the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission. It uses four identical spacecraft flying in formation around Earth to catch magnetic reconnection events in real time. By analyzing the data, scientists hope to better understand how particles are accelerated to high speeds, both near Earth and across the universe. Another mechanism that accelerates particles is known as wave-particle interaction. When electromagnetic waves collide and compress, trapped charged particles can bounce between them, gaining energy in a way similar to a ball bouncing between closing walls. These interactions occur regularly in near-Earth space and can damage satellites and spacecraft. NASA's Van Allen probes have been instrumental in studying these effects. Wave-particle interactions may also help explain how cosmic rays are accelerated following a supernova. They may also contribute to the acceleration of the solar wind and other high-energy particles from the sun. While the speed of light itself is out of reach, these natural and engineered processes show that getting close might be possible in the future.